songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, uh, first off, a uh, big thanks to Tobin from coming uh, up from Lewiston to Thank you. <laughs> uh, today we are concluding uh, this series uh, called Embracing Exile. And really what I hope is over the past uh, several weeks is that it has given us some hope. That while we live in a world that is far from where scripture would call us to live, in a world that is full of evil and feels so unfamiliar for the people of God, that maybe there's still a lot of hope out there. In fact, maybe it is a chance for us to shine all the more as the people of God. Uh, I found a quote just this morning, actually, that said, to be Christian is to be fully awake to how evil and broken the world is, while simultaneously being convinced of hope. I love that. And so maybe we can embrace this period that feels like exile and use it as a chance to really return to what God calls us to be, to be salt and light in the world, to be people of grace and of holiness, people of both truth and love. Amen. And if we can do that, and follow in the footsteps of people like Daniel, and follow in the footsteps of Paul and the early church fathers, we can make an impact, because we have to remember that when the disciples started, they had no political power. They had no lawful authority. All they had was the word of God and the spirit of God. And they turned the world upside down. And in the end, that is all we need. And honestly, history would say having more than that usually turns into a distraction and not an advantage. Right. What we need is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. So this morning, I'm people of God in this world. And in this passage this morning, Paul, I think, gives us a very rich text that in many ways embodies what the people of God should be and how they should live in just a few short paragraphs. And so this morning we're going to work our way through this passage and really see what is it that we as God's people are called to do and to be. Well, the first thing is this, that we are called to embody the word. We are called to embody the word. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgives you. Amen. And when I see all of that in this passage, what I see is this. It is not just a call to proclaim the gospel, but to embody the gospel in how we live. Uh, think about what you just heard. To be holy, to be compassionate, to be kind and humble and gentle, patient, forgiving. That is exactly what God does for us, is it not? That's right. That is who God is to us. And our call is to be like Jesus in the world. And so the gospel is not just something that we proclaim with our words, but it is something that we embody with our lives. Amen. I've been to a few concerts um, at the Spokane Arena up in Spokane. When I was a youth pastor, it was about an hour away from where I was. And so anytime the Rock and Worship Roadshow or Winter Jam came through there, it was an easy youth group trip up there to go see uh, uh, some Christian bands and stuff. And I've seen a few other con concerts there as well. But whenever I have been in Spokane Arena, there is a, a group of people who always are out there while you are waiting in line. And they are pronouncing hell and judgment on everyone in the crowd. They have their signs that say, turn to Jesus. But what they have is they're walking around, some of them have megaphones going, 
repent, you're going to hell. And they will point you out in a crowd and say, like, and, and yell at you. Um, and so it's a, it's a strange experience when you're waiting in line at a Christian concert, <laughs> being told that you are going to hell. Um, it, it, very strange. And so what, what's strange, though, is they are partially correct. They are telling the crowd, you need Jesus. And that is true. But their words are full of anger and judgment and hatred towards everyone there. And the truth is this. I have never seen anyone respond positively to the gospel because of people yelling at them. I, I, I have yet to see that actually work. Um, but what Paul reveals in what he's saying here is just speaking the truth of the gospel is not enough. It must also be embodied in how we live. St. Right. Francis of Anassi said, it is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. Right. It is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says this, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And I have to think that maybe one of the reasons that the church is in this position of exile where the world has moved away from the church is maybe somewhere along the way, our message became more about simple words that have not been lived out. But the call for us now is to take these words of Jesus and live them out, to bless our communities, to be ambassadors of truth and love and forgiveness. We are not just to speak the message, but to become the message as well. Jesus was the word made flesh, and our word ha words have to take on flesh as well. And history proves time and time again that when the people proclaim the gospel in both word and deed, it changes lives and it changes communities. Because the truth spoken and the truth lived out in the power of the Holy Spirit do not fail. So a question worthwhile for us might be, how does it look for me to embody the gospel in my life? What does it look like for me to become the message and not just speak a message? And I can guarantee this, anyone you show godly love to and serve in, in a godly way will be impacted by your life. Whether they truly respond to saving grace is one thing, but they will be impacted by your life. And I want to say this, is I'm not minimizing the importance of speaking the message, all right? We have to actually say the words. If people are going to be saved, we actually have to speak the message of the gospel. And as a preacher, I, I certainly believe there is power in the spoken message. But if that story is not embodied by the same people who claim to have been transformed by it, it loses its credibility. We cannot preach a message and then not live it out and expect people to actually believe what we're saying. Amen. The reason the disciples turned the world upside down was because not, not just because they had a message, but because they lived out that message. And so the church in this time, we must learn to embody the word. We must become the message. Amen. And that leads to number two is, we must become the church. We must become the church. In verse 15, Paul says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and to be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. What you see in this passage is a call for the people of God to truly become the church. Amen. And I've said this many times before, and as long as I'm here, I'll probably say it many more times, that our faith is not meant to be lived solo. But we are meant to live out our faith in the context of community. And in these verses, you see that. It says that we are called to be members of one body, that we are to teach and admonish one another, and to live at peace with one another. One of the things I think has been overemphasized in recent years is the phrase, our personal relationship with Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. Your personal relationship with Jesus is important and vital. 
It's important that you have a personal fellowship with God. But when that's the only thing we talk about, what happens is our faith becomes very individualistic and not communal. And the truth is, our faith is not to be an individualistic faith. It is meant to be a communal faith lived out in the context of community. And I love this quote from Scott Daniels. He says, the church should be more than a place people go. It should be something that by God's grace we are becoming. He goes on to say this, it doesn't take the spirit of God to get a group of white middle class conservatives together. That is called a country club. He says it doesn't take the spirit of God to get a group of millennials together. That's called a concert. <laughs> what demands the spirit and requires the broken body and the shed blood is for people of different generations, different ethnicities, different cultures, different tastes, different political perspectives, and different social standings to all gather around the table of the Lord and become one body. That requires a truly Pentecostal work of the Spirit. And that is the community witness a divided and fractured world needs to see Amen. and be invited to enter. Amen. What this world desperately is hungering for is true community, true relationships, where there is peace and love and forgiveness. And the truth is, uh, technology has not done us any favors in this department. Um, that... Uh, with, with technology, it's so much easy for us to keep distance and not have that true connection with one another. But if the church can become a place where the table is always open, where there are always more seats available, a, a, a community you can enter and join, a people who truly love one another and are transformed by the Spirit together, that is a community that will change lives and communities. Amen. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 describes it like this. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus and Christ himself being the cornerstone, and whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Amen. So again, our faith is not meant to be lived out alone, but in the community of faith. And I've probably told this story before, but a story my brother told me that always impacted me was he, when he was in Haiti as a missionary, he went to a fairly remote place to go um, teach one day. And when he got there, he was greeted by a few people. And my brother asked, well, um, where is the church? Thinking that there was a building. Their response was, don't worry, they are coming. <laughs> he asked, where is the church? And he said, they are coming. And that's what we have to recapture. That the church is not a building. The church is a community of people that we have been baptized into, that we belong to, are accountable to, that we grow with and together embody the gospel to do the work of Jesus in the world. And it's not just a casual, casual gathering of acquaintances, but a community that we are bound to by the Spirit of God. What a difference that type of community could make. Amen. Then thirdly, we are called to be a Whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father through him. To keep the faith in this world in a way that will actually make a difference in this world, we must get back to what it means to be a people of holiness. A people defined by God in their lives, not defined by the world around them. That's why Paul says here, in whatever you do, whether in word or deed. So if it wasn't clear enough when he says, in whatever you do, he adds on whether in word or deed. And it's pretty hard to do anything outside of word or deed, isn't it? That pretty much encompasses everything possible for us to do. He says, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do it with Jesus in mind. That our mission in the world really is to be an extension 
of who God is in the world. To be his hands and feet. Being a people of holiness means that we are a people primarily formed by the ways and values of God. And as we've talked about over the past few weeks, that we are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood called to be holy. It means that when we go to our places of work, or our schools, or we're with our families, it means we recognize that we are Christ's ambassadors in those places. It means that we recognize sin in the world for what it is, and intentionally not allow ourselves to participate in it. It means that we live with integrity and we allow the Spirit to transform and guide us every step of the way. And what the world really needs now really is for us to once again be what the core doctrine of the Church of Nazarene is. They need a church to be holy again. To be holy and sanctified. Far too often the church has either allowed themselves to be more formed by the world than scripture. And so they compromise on things that are <laughs> sinful and allow sinfulness to thrive. Or they've become so rigid and rule oriented that they become arrogant and proud. And what we need is to stay in that tension between those two. Where we say, no, I will not give in to sin, even if it's popular. I will not compromise on scripture. I will not participate, much like Daniel, in, these, in the ways of the world. But that we also be a people of love and grace who welcome the outsider into the family as they are being formed by God too. It is this tension that we must hold between knowing what sin is and not allowing it to rule us, but also being people of grace and love to those who need it. Amen. And the truth of Scripture is so clear on this point that we are to be reflections of Christ in the world, to be holy. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, For God has not called us to impurity, but to holiness. Romans 6 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit that gets, that you now have is to sanctification and its end is eternal life. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16, but he who called you is holy, you also will be holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy as I am holy. Hebrews 12, 14, strive for peace with everyone. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7.1 Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Amen. So what I hope is clear is simply put, we are meant to be a holy people. We are not meant to get through this world by just the skin of our teeth holding on. But we're meant to live victorious lives, not stuck in cycles of sin. But I have to believe God has so much more in store for us than that. That when we give our whole selves to God, he will do a work in us beyond what we maybe even thought possible he could do. Amen. And we will see God work in us and through us. We are called to be sanctified, to be set apart to find our wholeness in Christ. And when that happens, even in the midst of this crazy world that is full of evil, we will see the kingdom of God built. Even so. That's why Romans 8 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. We are called to be a holy people. All right, I'll try to be a little less Nazarene for the next uh, little bit, all right? And then fourthly, we must open our eyes. We must open our eyes. We have to have our eyes opened to what God is doing around us. We need to be actively looking for how God is showing up in the world. What's easy to do, and I see it all the time, is that we look at the condition the world is in, and we just think, nothing good is happening. Everything is wrong. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. And, you know, it's, it, well, we might as well just wait till the end. 
But if we will open our eyes in the midst of all of this, God shows up. And if we look for him, we'll see him showing up in hundreds of different ways all the time. If we still believe God is active, which I hope you do, if we still believe that he's in the business of making things new and redeeming the world, then we must open our eyes to see what he's doing. One of the um, kind of common threads through a lot of uh, kind of crime type TV shows is there's inevitably that one main character who always notices things that no one else does, right? You look at like any detective show, any crime show, any investigation, like there's always that one guy who will walk into a crime scene and examine and pick up on clues and connect dots and piece things together uh, as to what actually happened. And what you realize is that the evidence was there the whole time, it just took someone who had the eyes to see it to connect the dots. And I think that is what we need to be like in the world. We need to be looking for the activity of God, looking deeper than surface level, and piecing together the clues so that we can say to ourselves, it's him again. Amen. It's God again. Amen. He's working. I see it. I want to read a short excerpt from a book. Um, it was uh, by Cornelius Van Pearson, and it's simply called Him Again. He says, one day in the desert, an old couple had a baby. They were 95 and 100 years of age, way past the time possible to procreate. And yet here it is, Isaac, the son of laughter. It's as though the crowds look on and wonder, how does this happen? How does a couple that has been barren for so long have a child? The wise ones, the master detectives in the crowd say, it's him again. It's Yahweh, the one who created the universe. It's him again. Amen. Moses stands the sea, facing the wrath of Pharaoh. raises his staff and the waters part in two. The crowd looks on with wonder. How does this happen? How does the sea open up and allow people to enter new life? The wise ones, the master detectives in the crowd say, it's him again. Yahweh, the one who created the universe, the one who gave the baby, it's him again. In the wilderness, the people are hungry. They have nothing to eat. One day they wake up with a strange kind of bread covering the floor of the desert. The crowds look on with wonder, how does this happen? How does bread show up in the wilderness and feed a great multitude? The wise ones, the master detectives in the crowd say, it's him again. Amen. It's Yahweh, the one who created the universe, the one who gave the baby, the one who parted the sea, it's him again. The story could go on this way, the walls of Jericho fell, a shepherd boy defeats a giant, a prophet called down fire. A strange figure stands in the midst of a fiery furnace. God meets his people, uh, his hopeless people in exile. And they all say it's him again, it's him again, it's him again. The story could be carried forward. One day an anxious crowd stands beneath a cross upon which hangs a humble carpenter from Nazareth. The people ask, who is the one who came in the name of the Lord? Who is the one who made the lame dance, who made the blind see, who made the deaf to hear, who made the mute sing with joy? The wise ones, master detectives in the crowd say, it's him again. It's Yahweh, the one who created the universe, the one who gave the baby, the one who parted the sea, the one who gave bread in the wilderness, the one who slayed Goliath, the one who rescued the Hebrew children, it's him again. And if I can conclude this one last slide, it would be that when the world looks upon a people called the church, who are experiencing various levels of uncertainty, fears, and dislocation, yet are able to release all that has happened in the past in order to receive the new things that God wants to do, then the people, and, and they witness a people from every tribe, nation, and language embracing exile, and becoming a people who uniquely reflect the grace and mercy of God to the world, the wise ones and the master detectives in the crowd will say, it's him again.
And so our call this morning as the church is to embrace this time of exile. Not as a defeated people who believe they no longer make a difference, but as a people who are being made new in the image of God. And know that just as a little band of disciples changed the world, we with the Spirit of God can change our communities. Amen. And the call for us is to go from this place, go out into the world, a place where we feel like we're in exile, but to go out and be the church, be the people of God, be a holy people who have their eyes open to what God is doing. And hopefully as our children and our grandchildren watch our stories unfold, they will look what happens in our lives and they will say, it's him again. Amen. And so as we end this series and, and this morning, we're going to come to the communion table together. And um, I'm going to invite uh, Tobin to come and, and play for us while we get the elements but as we uh, partake the elements today, my encouragement to you is just to reflect on this fact, that these elements, this, the, the, the broken body and the poured out blood, is all we need in this world. That what is represented here is all we need. That all we need is Jesus. And because of his sacrifice on the cross, we can sing, Jesus is ours. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to invite you to come in a second and partake of the elements. And once everyone has gone through, we'll partake of them together. Uh, as always, if you meet the gluten-free option, it is on the left side. So would you come and receive the elements this morning?
took the bread, he broke it, he said, this is my body broken for you. Let's Amen. eat remembering his sacrifice. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. And with this blood comes the new covenant Father, we thank you for the difference the cross makes. Thank you for your sacrifice, and thank you that you rose again conquering death. And that because of that, as your people, death no longer has power over us. And Lord, my prayer for us today, as we prepare to leave this place as simple, may we become what we eat. That as we have taken these elements representing who you are, may we in turn be transformed as we leave this place and be an extension of who you are in the world around us this week. May we be your church. May we have our eyes open. May we walk in holiness through the power of your spirit. And as we do, help us to call others into this place that we would see others brought to full faith in you and transformed by your grace. So be with us and empower us as we leave. We pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Amen. 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 Amen.